so great to be here this afternoon, and I'd like to also thank Leslie and Margaret for inviting me. It's a, it's a thrill to be here and to hear all these great papers today. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, my favorite period of human evolution. That is the Holocene. It's often times ignored. I don't know why, because it uh, has all kinds of data and many more skeletons than, say, in the early Pleistocene, right, Peter? Uh, and but all that aside, I'd like to just introduce my talk by saying that uh, agriculture is one of the most important developments in human evolution, uh, right up there with bipedality, uh, cooking, uh, uh, speech. I think it's one of the one of the hallmarks of what we are today. What we see in living humans uh, is very much a product of the whole history of human evolution and including uh, what takes place in the Holocene. So where did it all start? Uh, well, when is about 10 to 12,000 years ago. Uh, where is kind of everywhere. Uh, it's in at least 10 to, 10 to a dozen independent centers. It's uh, taking place in North America, South America, uh, uh, Europe, Asia, Polynesia, all within a very short period of time. And sometimes when I talk to archaeologists about what is short uh, in terms of time period, uh, some regard that is a long time when you look at the fact that humans and human ancestors have been around for a good seven, eight million years, give or take. Uh, 10,000 years is really quite a small piece of the whole uh, picture. So this brings me to our central question today, uh, in my talk anyway, what were the costs and benefits of the global shift in diet from hunting and gathering to agriculture? That's the real crux of the biscuit here in terms of what we're trying to figure out with, with the Holocene. The answer to that question is important because it helps explain what is human today. We have all the other parts, pieces of bipedality, speech, and so forth, but the impact of agriculture plays a huge role in defining what we look at, look like, what we do in our various activities. So let's kind of look at this from the perspective of the common perception. Uh, that is, if we went out here on campus and asked, you know, was agriculture a good thing or not, uh, I would say that the, the, the consensus among the public is that farming fueled an improvement in the human condition, no doubt. So a life before agriculture, it was a savage existence, following animals just to kill them to eat, or moving from one berry patch to another and living just like an animal. Agriculture was the great leap forward, the advance that catapulted us out of the hand-to-mouth, day-to-day existence of hunter-gatherers and into the complex, cultured, literate existence of modern human beings. And finally, there's a bunch more, but I picked three. Domestication allowed for diverse food choices, emphasizing here diverse. Rather than spending the majority of time simply searching for food, human beings were able to build complex societies, eventually leading to the development of civilization. So I think that kind of summarizes uh, the, the general picture. So what's the evidence? Well, uh, one line is, of evidence is looking at uh, nutrition. And we heard a lot of good stuff today about nutritional aspects of starches and protein and so forth. But uh, the nutritional record predicts one story, that is, uh, focus on domesticated cereals predicts poor nutrition and poor health outcomes. Domesticated plants are, are deficient in one or more essential amino acids, lysine for maize, millet, and wheat. None of the common domesticated cereals have adequate iron, calcium, or zinc. Uh, they're all deficient in one or more vitamins, B1, B2, B12, uh, C. Uh, there are clear links with malnutrition, poor growth, immunosuppression, and susceptibility to a variety of path pathogens. And finally, from the nutritional record, uh, cereal grains are carbohydrates promoting tooth decay, dental caries, and gum disease, uh, gingivitis. So the nutritional perspective would predict something different from the, the common perspective. So what I'm going to talk about for the remainder of my, my discussion here is the record from uh, looking at large samples of human remains globally, uh, that is uh, the bioarchaeological perspective. Uh, so just to emphasize that 
The real revolution in understanding past diets, I think, is with stable isotope analysis, particularly look at the ratio of C13 to C12. And, but just to reemphasize, it's a very important part of our understanding of past diets. For, the, for those interested, it's, uh, the values are measured in parts per thousand, so it's a very tiny little uh, measurement, but nevertheless important. Measuring different, different types of, of uh, plants consumed, either C3 or C4, with uh, maize here, uh, is a C4 plant that uh, dominated in many areas of, of the globe. So there are a wide variety of regional patterns in terms of dietary change in the, in the Holocene uh, regarding agriculture. Some of the best record is from North America. Eastern North America showing the very negative values there on the y-axis refer to uh, populations eating no maize, the negative minus tw uh, 25. At the top there on the y-axis is a minus five where they're eating, uh, where their diet is dominated by maize. And if you look at the last four or 5,000 years of occupation of Eastern North America, uh, we see no maize consumption until about A.D. 800 to 1,000, and then that food source takes off in a huge way. Very, very dramatic change in diet. And this mirrors, I think, a lot of places in the world with regard to other domesticated plants in terms of rice, uh, a barley, rye, and so forth. But this is just one well-studied region showing these dietary changes. And to kind of telescope down even further, uh, this is work that I've been doing with Margaret for the last uh, several decades, I hate to say that, but that's true. Uh, and this is one part of our, our long-term study showing uh, the dramatic changes on a very local scale where early prehistoric populations, that is pre-AD uh, 1150, uh, no maize go to, going to late prehistoric populations in later prehistory uh, increased consumption of maize. And then finally, during the colonial period and um, the, the mission period, there is a huge focus on, ma on maize in diet, uh, so much so that it's probably 80 or 90 percent of, of their dietary consumption. Uh, so those, those, that graph showing going from highly negative to less negative illustrates, even at the local level, what's taking place. And of course, we heard today about the use of microware. I kind of like these images. Um, these are the old traditional way of looking at microware, but it illustrates the, uh, the big differences here in diet between uh, foragers, hunter-gatherers, and farmers within the same general region, showing lots of pits and fissures and so forth on your left, reflecting a hard coarse diet, and these farmers eating soft porridges and corn mushes. So what, what else did agriculture do? Well, basically it fueled the, the population explosion of the Holocene uh, shown in this, in this graph where population begins to take off with, uh, uh, in the early Holocene with, with uh, farming and uh, accelerates to the, to, the, to the present where uh, we're looking at uh, soon a, po a global population of 8 billion people. Agriculture did uh, that in large part. Uh, agriculture leads to large and densely settled communities. What, what's important about that? Uh, at, for example, these two places, Chetelhuyuk in Southwest Asia and Cahokia in Eastern North America, is it changes the whole dynamic of population placement, population location, where people are now living in close, crowded living conditions, uh, literally on top of each other, uh, and those conditions setting up uh, an environment for the origin and spread of infectious disease, another important part of human evolution. So let's look at some, some outcomes briefly here. Uh, one of the most important, I think, is the rise in competition with more people, social conflict and warfare, which are important in terms of contributing to a highly elevated stress rates and mortality. Another critical outcome, I think, is in terms of fundamental changes in activity and lifestyle, indicating a general pattern of workload in the Holocene relative to earlier populations. Now, in the 70s, as we all know, the classic work done on uh, the Khoisan uh, depicted hunter-gatherers as, as a life of leisure. and We, all, of course, know that that's, that's not the case, but it's a testable hypothesis looking at the bioarchaeological record. 
And so work that I've been doing with Chris Ruff also for several decades is looking at the biomechanical record in terms of Holocene human evolution, this foraging to farming transition. And basically what we see in hunter-gatherers is more bone, more widely distributed uh, in cross-section compared to agriculturalists reflecting a decline in workload, a decline in mechanical loading, and therefore less bone. And part of this is mitigated by dietary changes, uh, the foraging to farming transition, uh, as we saw in the nutritional studies, is not a good one. So part of this is diet, but I think a large part of it is activity. And this, is, this record is also revealed in looking at osteoarthritis, uh, shown in the, the image there, all the, the extra bone along the margins of the vertebrae reflect uh, activity and activity loading on the back. And we're finding that in general, as a very general pattern, there's a reduction in osteoarthritis with the transition from foraging to farming. Lots of exceptions to that, but as a general pattern, it fits the biomechanical record. A third important outcome, uh, we know that humans have cooked their food for at least the last 300 to 400,000 years. Um, and so it's a, it's a long-term uh, presence in, in human nutrition, but really a big impact, a big factor here is the invention of ceramics in the, in the Neolithic and cooking vessels to produce softer, uh, easier chewed foods. What impact does that have? Well, there's a nutritional content to it, um, making the, the starch more available in terms of nutrition. Um, but it also had a fundamental change and in, in result in craniofacial growth and development, resulting basically in considerable reduction in robustity of the face and jaws, uh, increased uh, occlusal abnormalities, that is uh, especially increased tooth crowding as the jaws and size of the face reduced, but the teeth teeth also reduced, but not nearly at the same rate. So that's a huge part of the story as well in terms of the agricultural transition. Fundamental changes in cr the craniofacial architecture owing to the changes in chewing. Another huge outcome of this, uh, just not to belabor the case, but another important outcome is increased disease load and one of the most common diseases today, as it was beginning with agriculture, is dental caries and poor oral health, showing there in the, the images on your left, an individual with uh, rampant dental caries and individual on the right uh, obviously did not floss his teeth. Uh, so it's all about not only the food, but also hygiene. And of course, uh, hygiene was, was not nearly what we, what we have today. But the graph there shows uh, the three bars on, the, on your left uh, showing the foragers and the uh, lack of uh, maize consumption. So no dental caries or very little, and then rapid increase in dental caries in later uh, prehistoric populations, mirroring uh, beautifully the isotope record in terms of dietary change. And another development, of course, that we're all familiar with is, is infectious disease. This really took off, infectious diseases really took off in the Holocene with the agricultural transition. And if you look there in the upper, your upper left, there's a, a bone showing a bunch of bumps and grooves, and that's a osteoperistitis. It's a nonspecific infection. We don't know what caused it, but it is all over the place globally when it is absent uh, prior to the agricultural revolution. Uh, also shown there is a, a, a new developing disease, tuberculosis, and on the bottom, treponemal disease, both uh, venereal and non-venereal syphilis globally. And related to this are, are what happens when water sources become contaminated in these close, crowded living conditions. And it sets up a perfect environment for uh, par parasites and parasitic infection. And what you see in uh, your, your lower right there is the skeletal evidence in the, in the, in the fossil record, that is the Holocene fossil record, of what's called crib orbitalia, which is the outcome of iron deficiency anemia. So parasites res uh, contribute to reduced absorption of iron from diets that are, that are already iron poor. And resulting from, from this sort of uh, agglomeration of poor diets, uh, parasitic infections, and so forth, is developmental arrest, and which is beautifully illustrated in this individual showing enamel hypoplasia 
Um, and that is, if you look carefully at the teeth here, see the lines up there on the teeth. There are several on the central uh, incisors, and uh, this reflects where the individual, the, the teeth stopped growing. The individual recovered the stress. They started, the teeth started growing again, and uh, then another stress episode happens. Uh, these two are, these are also quite frequent in the Holocene and relatively infrequent, uh, except in Neanderthals maybe, uh, in, in the Pleistocene. This, this lays the, the context for today's world. Uh, from relatively benign changes, or this little girl's got braces on her teeth, owing to parents saying your teeth are too crowded, reflecting reduced bone in her jaws, to more consequential changes, the agricultural transition is a long process. We're still experiencing it today. This graph shows a study we're doing in Europe on about 10,000 uh, historic and antiquity-aged uh, uh, Europeans showing a big spike and increase in dental caries in the late medieval period, and an example of what caries looks like in these, in these populations. And also it laid the foundation for uh, epidemics of the pre-modern world, the plague, population size reaches a point where a population is fueled by agriculture and it reaches a size where plague has a heyday. And in the modern world, the appearance of new and nasty viruses, HIV and Ebola, uh, it's not that agriculture, agriculture created these viruses or had, uh, had an influence except to say that the, that the deteriorating population conditions are an important element for their, their rise. And finally, the obesity epidemic that we heard a little bit about before, this is fueled also indirectly by the agricultural revolution. So just to sum up, uh, farming puts into place an ongoing long-term process facilitating poor nutrition and health outcomes. There are enormous health costs both in the past and today owing to this transition. There are fundamental changes in activity and lifestyle. And it is a central element for what we are today is a biological organism. So just to wrap up my talk, I'll leave you with one question here. How will society mitigate the circumstances put into play over 10,000 years ago? Thank you.